deadly, highly destructive, and impossible to predict. Earthquakes are one of Mother Nature's most terrifying forces. Every year, there are half a million detectable earthquakes. Only 100,000 of those are strong enough to be felt, but 100 of them are so powerful that they cause damage, injury, and even death. The world's surface is not solid. It's made up of separate tectonic plates that are constantly moving and shifting. Sometimes the edges get caught against each other, storing up huge amounts of energy. When that energy is released, the forces can cause chasms to open in the ground and buildings to collapse. With eyewitness accounts and fascinating expert insights, we investigate a catastrophic magnitude 7 earthquake that struck Haiti on the 12th of January 2010, as well as two earthquakes that occurred in Mexico City exactly 32 years apart, and see how lessons learned from the 10,000 deaths in the first disaster helped to save lives in the second. First, in this episode of Deadly Disasters, we'll focus on the horrific earthquake that struck Haiti in 2010. Located on the West Indian island of Hispaniola, Haiti is one of the poorest nations in the world. More than half its citizens survive on less than $2 a day. It has a population of nearly 10 million, many living in makeshift dwellings. Non-profit organizations like EcoWorks have been helping Haitian communities foster infrastructure development since 2008. The infrastructure was what it is, unfortunately, still today, which is that for people who live in poverty, which is the greater majority of the population, they don't have access to power, to water, or to sewage. The country is no stranger to natural disasters. In 2008, it was hit by four hurricanes, which caused flooding, landslides, and left 800 people dead. This impoverished country was still struggling to recover from those hurricanes when they were struck by one of the world's worst natural disasters. Just before five o'clock in the evening, on the 12th of January 2010, Haiti was suddenly rocked by a magnitude 7 earthquake. It was the most powerful earthquake to hit the area in more than 200 years. Basically, earthquakes are the result of the movement of the Earth's plates. Uh, the plates move because of the internal heat of the Earth, which moves them around. And uh, the plate boundaries, where the plates meet each other, uh, that's where you can generate earthquakes, because you've got giant fractures in the Earth's crust. Those are moving very slowly. They're only moving at about the same rate as your fingernails grow, which is from millimeters to centimeters per year. But eventually, the stress is so high that it overcomes the friction, and then the fault moves very rapidly. Uh, a couple of meters per second, and that will then generate earthquakes which travel as waves uh, through the solid part of the Earth. The epicenter of this cataclysmic event was below the city of Leogan, about 25 kilometers from the capital, Port-au-Prince. The earthquake was unusually near the surface, occurring at a depth of only 13 kilometers. This dramatically increased the level of shaking above. Port-au-Prince in Haiti is very close to the plate boundary uh, of what's called the Ganave microplate. 
and uh, that southern boundary stretches all the way from Jamaica. In fact, it goes all the way through the center of Jamaica and then goes uh, all along the southern peninsula of Haiti and passes very close to Port-au-Prince. Shocks quickly spread throughout Haiti and the neighboring Dominican Republic, as well as to parts of the nearby Caribbean islands of Cuba, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Roughly three million people were affected by intense shaking that was strong enough to cause damage to buildings. The closer they were to the epicenter, the more destruction occurred around them. The capital, Port-au-Prince, and the densely populated surrounding areas didn't stand a chance. The same amount of energy as 35 atomic bombs, just like the one that destroyed the city of Hiroshima, was released in 30 seconds of intense shaking. Port-au-Prince was simply ripped apart. What shocked me the most is the magnitude and the horror of the devastation. It was just unimaginable. Uh, it looked like a war zone. Uh, people were crying, people were looking for loved ones under the rubble, sometimes with bare hands and were trying to get them out. It was really extremely painful and, and hard to live through. You cannot find no person have life uh, down the scrap house, no, no, no life. The Haiti earthquake was a magnitude seven, which classed it as a major earthquake. But how exactly are earthquakes measured? Earthquakes are measured either by their, the energy they release or by the damage they are doing. The energy that is released is measured with instruments that we call seismograph, and they measure the amount of energy that it released at a certain distance. Graphically, you can see the different waves that travel. And from the, the distance and the amount of energy that is released, we can determine the magnitude of the earthquake. Previously, we used uh, what was called the Richter scale, and that's uh, most famous everywhere around, where around the world. They still talk about the, the Richter scale. And so actually the modern uh, magnitude, the, what I call the moment magnitude, is actually based on the Richter scale. The reason they did this was so, because people already knew what the Richter scale was. And so if you have an idea of, okay, this is a magnitude five, okay, so we have a moment magnitude. We put it very similar to a magnitude five from the Richter scale, so then it looks the same, so people know what it is. The damage from this magnitude seven earthquake was particularly devastating in Haiti. One of the problems uh, in the 2010 Haiti earthquake was the quality of, of the construction was very poor. Much of the construction was informal. There were no uh, inspections of the buildings. And there was also a use of cement sand mixtures. They were trying to stretch the cement, so they mixed it with either too much sand or sometimes sand that had salt in it so that the cement was not very, was not very strong. When the earthquake struck, thousands of buildings collapsed, killing or trapping their occupants inside. While such a powerful earthquake could be expected to cause destruction, experts were shocked by the catastrophic failure of so many buildings, even new and renovated schools, police stations, bank branches, high-end hotels and hospitals. Some uh, seismologists sort of have a saying that it's not earthquakes that kill people, it's buildings that kill people. The cathedral and the national palace were in ruins. The national prison in Port-au-Prince was so badly damaged that 3,000 dangerous criminals were able to escape. The damage happens when you are within buildings that are not uh, built according to code or fortified uh, for earthquakes. So the infrastructure that is not well prepared for earthquake is more dangerous than the earthquake itself. In 1989, a comparable earthquake occurred in San Francisco, but resulted in the loss of only a single life. The difference in that instance 
was infrastructure. Haiti simply lacked the same building standards, resulting in more widespread devastation. These were two similar earthquakes with hugely disproportionate consequences. In the town of Leogon, right above where the earthquake occurred, 90% of the buildings had simply ceased to exist. While in the small coastal fishing port of Petty Parody, on the west coast of Haiti, a tsunami wave swept inland, dragging several people to their deaths. Haiti was still trying to recover from the effect of the hurricanes two years earlier. In the face of this latest catastrophe, the country was unable to cope. Vital services needed to relieve the stricken country were either damaged or destroyed. What is the definition of a disaster for professionals like myself? It is an event that is of such magnitude that the local or the national government cannot face it alone. Efforts to get food, medical aid and water to the survivors were hindered by the breakdown in communication systems. Add to this the fact that the same year, the earthquake happens in January, in October, there is a cholera epidemic that was brought in by a contingent of the United Nations. Now 800,000 people are sick and more than 10,000 die. So when you talk about the logistics and the magnitude of what we were dealing with, it was beyond imagination. Although the runways at the Toussaint Louverture International Airport were intact, damage to the control tower meant that planes couldn't take off or land safely. At the main seaport, piers had collapsed and cranes had been knocked over, so ships were not able to unload urgently needed supplies. Almost all paved roads were blocked due to severe surface damage, fallen trees and debris from collapsed buildings. In the hours following the quake, survivors dug through rubble, often with their bare hands, to rescue family and friends. Dusk fell just two hours after the earthquake. In the eerie darkness, rescuers had to use flashlights as they continued to claw at the rubble, trying to reach those trapped beneath. Everywhere is dark. She's just like an incredible bright star in the middle of this, you know, darkness, and it's a like wonderful feeling. That night, many people in Haiti were forced to sleep on the streets, either because their homes had been destroyed or because they were terrified of aftershocks. When a fault moves and causes an earthquake, it changes the distribution of the stresses around the fault. So aftershocks are generated. They're usually smaller than uh, the main shock, uh, but there have been cases where they're almost as large as the main shock. As daylight broke on the morning following the earthquake, it became clear that thousands were either injured or had lost their lives. Most of the wounded had nowhere to go. Medical centers had either been destroyed or were out of action. A lucky few were treated at the only hospital operating in Port-au-Prince, a mobile field hospital. By chance, the hospital had already been set up by the Argentine Air Force, who were part of a UN peacekeeping mission stationed there. During the first night after the earthquake, staff managed to treat 1,000 wounded survivors. Helicopters airlifted those most gravely injured to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Doctors and nurses who had survived the earthquake set up makeshift triage centers in parking lots and other open spaces. Medics attended to the worst of the injuries as best they could. As the sun beat down on the car park of the Hospital de la Paix, those waiting to be treated lay among those who were already dead, while others with wounds open to infection could only sit at the roadside, hoping that help would arrive. 
Later, China announced that a 50-member rescue team would be sent to Haiti. But as the hours passed, the horrific scale of the devastation was becoming all too clear. The Haitian president, René Privé, told reporters that he believed over 100,000 may have perished in the earthquake. Many of the dead were hastily buried in mass graves. The presidential palace and many other government buildings had been smashed, hampering the country's already unsteady central government. Those who survived and who were civil servants, they also suffered tragedy. So given this situation, which was so painful and so beyond imagination, I actually give very high points to the government because they did regroup quite quickly and they tried to coordinate as, mu as much as they could. Haiti was a country that had ceased to function. This terrible disaster was turning into a horrific nightmare. Il ne reste que des poussières et des décombres. Non, non, nous n'avons absolument rien dans le pays. Le pays est totalement dévasté. Nous sommes dormis dans la rue. Nous sommes dans une situation. Nous vivons comme des animaux. Thankfully, towards the end of the day after the initial earthquake, the first international aid agencies began to arrive. Commandos of U.S. Air Force Special Operations managed to land at the airport in Port-au-Prince. Due to the damaged control tower, no aid flights had been able to bring relief to the survivors. Haitian authorities handed the airport over to the U.S. officials, who were able to allow aid flights to land the following day. The U.S. Army did very well. And so that helped a lot in the distribution of the aid that came, food, water, and everything else. A week after the earthquake, some aid had reached the capital, but in the rest of the country, people were still fending for themselves. Even before the disaster, only half of Haitians had access to clean water. Now that supply had been cut off. People searched the streets, carrying empty plastic bottles, gathering water from broken pipes and gutters, wherever they could find it. With food running out, some thirsty and desperately hungry people began to forage for supplies among the ruins. The United Nations, who were at the forefront of the initial response, already had a presence in Haiti but they had suffered many casualties as well. Their headquarters had collapsed and about 150 UN personnel, including the head of the peacekeeping mission, were unaccounted for. The initial response led by the new acting head, Edmund Mullet, was criticized for being too focused on security. They were concerned about the 3,000 inmates who had escaped from the collapsed jail in Port-au-Prince. The UN wanted to find the escaped criminals and maintain public order. Struggling Haitian police regrouped and attempted to deal with the increasingly chaotic environment. Several days after the initial earthquake, exhausted rescue teams continued to comb through the rubble, desperately searching to find anyone left alive. Although some people had been miraculously rescued, hope of finding any more survivors was rapidly fading. Despite more and more aid finally arriving to the country, it was not enough to deal with the ever more desperate situation. In 
emergency medical teams were working out of shipping containers, performing life-saving amputations, and urgent calls went out to U.S. medical schools for extra volunteers. If you have teams that are prepared to get people to safe places to treat people who are injured or damaged in some medical way, you're going to reduce the death toll enormously. Preparation is the key to reducing the negative effects of any natural catastrophe. As aftershocks rocked an area 15 kilometers west of the capital, aid officials feared that if help could not be delivered to the three million survivors still fending for themselves, there would be a total collapse of law and order. U.S. Marines on troop ships began disembarking in Haiti to assist the struggling relief effort. They brought much-needed heavy equipment, as well as other urgent supplies. You need to have the right equipment for the particular kind of problem that you're dealing with, right? Um, whether it's robots that help you find people that are buried in an earthquake, or whether it's uh, water purification systems, et cetera, and the right meds for the most likely types of scenarios that you're going to encounter in these events. Aid distribution was chaotic. U.S. helicopters unloaded boxes of ready-to-eat meals. They contained powdered food, but to the Haitians, they just looked like packets of dust. Many people threw them away because no French or Creole language instructions explained that they needed to be prepared by mixing with water. Despite the fact that the airport was open, Aid groups complained of long delays in getting vital supplies of food, water, and medicine. Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, reported that its cargo plane, with 12 tons of urgently required medical supplies, had been turned away from the congested airport three times. One doctor reported that they had been forced to buy a saw from a local market so that they could continue to perform amputations. With 16,000 boots on the ground, the US Army reported that 400,000 bottles of water and 300,000 food rations had been delivered since they first arrived on the scene the day after the earthquake. With over a million people left homeless, those displaced in urban areas were forced to shelter in flimsy makeshift camps. Only around 130 people were rescued from collapsed buildings by international rescue teams. Two weeks after the initial earthquake, the search for survivors was largely abandoned and all efforts now focused on retrieving the dead. 250,000 to 300,000 die, 300,000 are injured, and 1.5 million are homeless. Although billions were raised through international efforts from both government and charitable bodies, Haiti is still gripped by grinding poverty and underinvestment. But the fact that young people are now being trained in safe building practices shows that Haitians are trying to learn lessons from those terrible events. Proper training of the local population is crucial to the success of any emergency response effort. Regular drills must be undertaken to ensure that people are adequately prepared for the likely event that another deadly earthquake will strike in the future. When it comes to lessons learned from past disasters, few places can rival the city that we focus on next in this episode. 
On the afternoon of the 19th of September 2017, a magnitude 7 earthquake, the same force as the one that struck Haiti, hit Mexico City. Dozens of buildings collapsed, and a total of 369 people lost their lives. But in 1985, exactly 32 years prior to that day, an earthquake in the same city caused more than 400 buildings to collapse, killing over 10,000 people and leaving 5 million with no power or water. We have, in the last 35 years, we have had two very important events in Mexico City. One was the 85 earthquake. That earthquake was a subduction earthquake. It was produced on Lázaro Cárdenas, on Michoacán, around 250 kilometers from the city. That earthquake was very destructive. We had a lot of, of damaged buildings and a lot of collapsed buildings. A lot of people died in that, in that earthquake. And it was combined with the aftershock the day after. So it has been the most destructive earthquake in the city. Why was there so much more death and destruction in the 1985 earthquake? The difference between the two disasters has been largely attributed to a change in the building regulations and the introduction of an early warning system. Um, so after the 1985 earthquake, the Michoacan earthquake, there was the need of establishing an early warning system um, for Mexico City. The early hours of the 19th of September, 1985. Just as millions of people were getting ready for their day, Mexico City was struck by a magnitude eight earthquake, one of the most powerful ever to hit the area. It was also one of the longest. The terrified inhabitants had to endure intense shaking that lasted for nearly three minutes. El edificio este que está aquí se movía como un péndulo, o sea, como un marcapasos. Este se escuchaba crujir los golpes del de, golpeteo. Vi como lo, las paredes se, se abrían, se partían como cual si les hubiera caído un rayo. Era de una intensidad que me aventaba contra las paredes. Como que nunca piensas que se va a caer el edificio, pero de repente volteo y empiezo a ver que empiezan a botarse los ladrillos. The quake extended over a vast area. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, tremors were felt as far away as Guatemala City and Houston, Texas, over 1,500 kilometers away from the epicenter. The quake occurred along a vast subduction zone, which is part of the Middle American Trench. This is the eastern part of what is arguably the most dangerous series of fault lines in the world, the Ring of Fire, a volatile strip which runs in a 40,000 kilometer horseshoe around the edge of New Zealand in the Pacific Ocean, passing Indonesia, the Philippines, Japan and Russia, across to Canada, the Pacific coast of America, Mexico, and down the eastern coast of South America. Roughly 90% of all earthquakes occur along this ring. Although the epicenter of the earthquake was in Michoacan, the majority of the damage occurred in Mexico City, over 300 kilometers away. How could an earthquake so far away prove to be so catastrophic? The answer lies in the very dawn of civilization, when the Aztecs settled in Mexico and developed a vast empire. They created their capital on two small islands in Lake Texcoco. By 1519, it was home to an estimated 400,000 inhabitants. When the Spanish conquered the Aztecs, they destroyed the city and built a new one on the ruins. After Mexico's independence, this ancient site became its capital. 
Mexico City is a very unique place in the world. It sits atop a lake bed zone, very high water content. We call them saturated soil. Uh, that lake was uh, drained over time and in the 1960s is when it was uh, drained 100%, the last of the lake was, is gone. Unfortunately, what that meant is uh, people moved into that area as it, the lake was drained. So now people live where there used to be a lake. And what that means is for uh, earthquakes is that uh, it amplifies the signal greatly because it's a, it's a basin and uh, they're basically sitting on what used to be mud. We study the subsidence. So what happens is in Mexico City, because of the lake sediment, is moving downward every year by about 35 centimeters. In every place in the world that they study uh, seismology, they talk about Mexico City. The earthquake caused widespread catastrophic damage. Several old hotels, including the Regis, Versailles, and Romano, fell to the ground. Gas mains were fractured, causing fires and explosions. Many multi-story buildings collapsed completely. Nearly 7,000 were seriously damaged. Fortunately, the quake struck when many were still commuting to work. Yo quedé pues este brazo atrapado, la cabeza con la losa aquí, pero este brazo libre y las piernas debajo de la mesa del comedor que se me salvaron por eso. Pega en el piso eso que aparentemente era una columna, se abre un agujero negro y nos vamos. De tal manera que nosotros no encontramos obstrucción desde el lugar donde nos encontrábamos hasta llegar al sótano del al fondo del sótano del edificio. Esta cosa llega y se clava. Y nos detiene una losa. 13 hospitals were destroyed. In the immediate aftermath, 40% of the population in Mexico City had no electricity. 45% were without water. President Miguel de la Madrid initially refused offers of help from the international community. He said that Mexico was well able to cope with the disaster on its own. Volunteers from areas of the city that had escaped largely undamaged went to the aid of their fellow citizens who had not been so fortunate. Residents spontaneously organized themselves into brigades, such as the Moles Rescue Brigade, to help in the search for survivors. We never knew each other. We started helping in the collapsed structures and start working and, and making friends and telling, well, we will meet here tomorrow and we start working. Cuando ya salimos, sentí que otra vez este, tenía una oportunidad y que ahora iba a estar en mano de los médicos para que me emparejaran mi brazo. There were extraordinary scenes of unity from the city's inhabitants, where many lent a helping hand to their neighbors. Estaban las obras del metro afuera de mi casa. Empezaron a entrar todos los muchachos del metro a ayudar a salcar gente. Sacaron a muchos vecinos de la parte de hasta arriba. Yo empecé a gritar, pero no me oían porque mi voz se moría porque por la postura en la que yo estaba. Y, pero me grité, grité, grité hasta que dije, no, pues no me oyen. ¿no? De pronto empecé a ver una luz porque yo así o así no veía nada. Y era un topo. Un topo me encontró. We start working with the people to save people and their belongings. Overall, there was a feeling of solidarity which was remarkable in such a vast, sprawling city. As the scale of the disaster became evident, thousands took to the streets in protest, demanding assistance. Following the demonstrations, the government's attitude to foreign aid softened. Mexico began to accept offers of money and help from many countries. Five days after the earthquake, Nancy Reagan visited the stricken city. She delivered a letter of sympathy from the U.S. president and a down payment of $1 million on future American aid. Hope of finding any last survivors 
faded. It was thought that no one could remain alive under the fallen masonry for more than a week. But rescuers working amongst the tangled wreckage of a maternity hospital were convinced that there were still people left alive in there. What happened next came to symbolize a spirit of resilience and togetherness in the face of terrible adversity. The 12-story tower of the Juarez Hospital was built in 1970. At the time of the earthquake, the hospital was nearly full, and more than 700 patients and doctors were believed to have been trapped inside. Rescue teams from several countries, as well as volunteers and family members of the victims, worked non-stop for days searching for survivors. Many bodies had already been found. But with the help of ultra-sensitive listening devices, people heard noises that gave them a small glimmer of hope. Images of rescue workers using pickaxes to dig their way to buried survivors were beamed around the world. A week after the hospital collapsed, an eight-day-old baby girl and a 33-year-old man were pulled alive from amongst the rubble. As dusk fell, another infant was pulled alive from the wreckage. In all, more than a dozen babies were rescued from the collapsed hospital. They became a symbol of hope for a devastated nation and have been known ever since as the Miracle Babies. Across Mexico City, many people were rescued alive from the debris, while thousands received medical treatment. 5,000 bodies were recovered from the rubble of the shattered city. But those were only the total number of legally certified deaths. Approximately 250,000 people were left without shelter. The total cost of the disaster to the Mexican economy was estimated to be more than $4 billion. In the first weeks after the earthquake, 720,000 tons of debris were removed. The disastrous 1985 earthquake led to the introduction of much tougher building regulations equal or superior to those found anywhere in the world, and to the formation of well-trained emergency search and rescue brigades. Well, there's a lot of challenges with disaster preparedness. It, uh, the challenges involve trying to figure out which disaster is more likely to cause more damage. What is the chance that something can happen, and if it happens, how bad is it likely to be? The catastrophe also resulted in the establishment of a seismic alarm system, which provides advanced warning whenever it senses movement on the Pacific coast. The main idea of the early warning system is that uh, we have a lot of devices that measures the movements along the Pacific coast. And the idea is when those devices record a very large motion, they sent a signal to Mexico City. So the idea is you could use that to give a little bit of warning to people for when the real hammer of the surface waves arrive. The early warning system received a major test on the night of the 7th of September, 2017. Mexico was rocked by a powerful magnitude 8.2 earthquake, nearly 725 kilometers from Mexico City. The early warning system worked exactly as planned. Sirens went off a full two minutes before the first tremors reached the city. Buildings shook, but the earthquake was so far away that there was little damage. Twelve days later, Mexico City took part in the annual drill to mark the anniversary of the fateful 1985 earthquake. Sirens wailed, but the atmosphere was calm. After all, this drill happened every year. When the sirens went off again a few hours later, 
Many believed it was still part of the earlier drill. But they were wrong. Within seconds, the city was struck by a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. The intense shaking lasted for only 20 seconds, but in that time, over 40 buildings collapsed, hundreds were killed, and thousands injured. It was 7.1 on magnitude scale, but it was too near. It was just like 120 kilometers from the center of the city. That means that from the south part of the city, because the city is very large, it was just like 100 kilometers, for example, from Xochimilco. We have movements in different ways, which cause a lot of problems to infrastructure, to buildings, to the metro system over there. El caer todos los vidrios de aquí de Soriana, el movimiento de aquí del mercado. Este, no sabíamos si si salirnos para acá porque en ese momento estaba cayendo para acá y ahí ahí en el mercado el movimiento nos impedía este caminar del todo bien. Eso fue este, híjole, algo este trágico. In the neighborhood of Roma Norte, an entire office building collapsed. Survivors were taken to hospital, but there were fears that many people were still trapped inside. Construction workers from a nearby site rushed to help. The government quickly declared a state of emergency. Federal police were swiftly deployed with 3,000 personnel taking to the streets. From all over the damaged areas of the city, there were reports of gas leaks and fires. Amid the increasing noise and clamor of a hectic rescue operation, it became clear that the faint sounds alerting search parties to the presence of survivors could be missed. Rather than yelling, rescuers developed a system of hand signals. A fist in the air, was a call for immediate silence. The gesture would be repeated by everyone around, silently spreading the message through the crowd. The call for everyone to stop moving was an open palm in the air, and a single finger in the air meant back to work. While in parts of the city that had not been affected, there was an eerie silence. Businesses had closed and the normally congested rush hour streets were mostly empty. But there was frantic activity at disaster sites. When rescuers arrived at the Enrique Repsiman School, they discovered a harrowing scene. Dozens of children and teachers had been buried when the three-story school building collapsed in on them. As rescuers clawed at the concrete with their bare hands, they could hear the screams of children trapped beneath the rubble. President Enrique Peña Nieto later visited the school to mourn the 20 children and two staff members who had lost their lives. Distraught parents clung to the hope that their missing children could still be saved. But tragically, only two children were pulled out of the wreckage. In the Condesa area, a man was rescued after being trapped under the wreckage of an apartment building for 22 hours. Rescuers had heard him screaming for help all night. The Mexican president announced that the damage caused by the earthquakes could cost upwards of $2 billion. But while there was loss of life and significant damage, it was nowhere near as bad as in the 1985 earthquake. 
millions of dollars had been spent to reinforce older buildings across the city. Building can be affected by earthquakes, but designing them correctly can eliminate a lot of the problems. The construction codes in Mexico City actually are one of the most rigorous codes in the world. And there, since the earthquake of 1985, there has been a lot of specific points that were studied by people from UNAM and the Engineering Institute. There are specialists that have helped the developing a more rigorous and more strict uh, construction code. In Mexico City, strict building controls are only a part of the system in place to help them become better prepared for future earthquakes. Teams of staff in the emergency services practice earthquake simulations throughout the year so they can respond immediately. But most important of all have been the huge public awareness campaigns that have trained the residents of Mexico City to understand exactly what to do when they hear the sirens. But we are still behind that other cities like, for example, Tokyo, Los Angeles, San Francisco, because in those places, people and society, it's more aware about how earthquakes can affect the buildings. For example, in San Francisco, in the Science Museum, they have a complete part of the museum dedicated to the earthquakes. I believe that Mexico can use those kind of ideas in order to the people get more prepared and more aware about how earthquakes can affect. However, the safety measure that would save most lives, the ability to accurately predict when and where an earthquake will strike, has proved to be stubbornly elusive. In order to understand the vulnerability of a place, we need to understand what is the probability of earthquake to occur. Prediction means that you give the exact time and place of an earthquake. What we can do just as we do with the weather, is we can forecast earthquakes. Now we can use a technology called GPS, the Global Positioning System, to survey the crust around a potential earthquake fault. We know that uh, the Earth is a chaotic system, and we can say that if we apply chaos theory here, we're actually never going to be able to predict, because we never knew, it, we're never going to know what the initial conditions were on the Earth, unfortunately. Now we have much more equipment, not just in the Earth, also in space, so we can have a lot of measurements and hopefully we could find some precursor that allows to make earthquake prediction. If we could predict that an earthquake is going to ha happen in 20 minutes, how useful would that be? Because it's not enough time to evacuate a city. What we'd really need is something like we have for hurricanes. What the ideal, we'd need three days warning, which would probably give us time to evacuate a large city like Mexico City. All we can be sure of is that some of the world's most populous and economically significant cities are situated on or near seismically active fault lines. For those cities, it is not a question of if an earthquake will strike, but when. We will always have to live with the threat of one of Mother Nature's most unpredictable and deadly forces, earthquakes.